people, welcome back to another episode of the Boombastic Cast with the one and only Alexander Hawk and Mr. Matthew Fisher. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, we're extremely happy uh, that today we get to interview a very controversial filmmaker, a filmmaker that people have given crap uh, to for many, many years, which uh, both of us think that he does not deserve. Agreed. And that, uh, and that would be Mr. Yui Bowl. Now, oh, yeah. I, I mean, the thing is that uh, first movie I saw that he did was In Name of the King, and I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I did not understand why so many people gave it so much hate. I, I I enjoyed it. I mean, being a big fantasy uh film uh, uh geek, I thought it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, and after I uh, you know contacted him, I watched a bunch of his other films, and fact is, yeah, you can argue that some of his earlier stuff might not ha have been as good, but he has. So many of his movies, I mean, the whole thing is a progression. I mean, when you're an artist, an actor, a director, or whatever art form you are, you start and, and, you know, things might not come off as perfectly as either he wanted or that the viewers wanted. But as as he progressed, I mean, he's done some films that really are extremely, uh, you know, just just hit you on such a visceral level, which you don't get from films nowadays. I mean, I can go in, watch uh, the next Avengers movie and be like, well, yeah, that was fun, but I'm not going to be thinking about it or talking about it, you know, 20 years from now. Yeah. But if you watch, like, uh, Attack of the Four or, you know, 1968 Tunnel Rats, which are two war movies that are done extremely well that really you just they might be hard to watch but they're hard to watch because they hit you in the spiritual level right and uh and the thing is that he's a very great uh very great filmmaker and i i definitely think that he should be given a lot more respect than he's given a lot of people give him a lot of shit which i don't think is deserved and that's my personal opinion you can, you know, you know. It's those nerds, Alex. It's those nerds that be hating on our boy. And I will strap on the gloves for round two, and I will fight all the people talking shit. I know what I mean? I mean, I mean, the thing is, he, like us, uh, is a film fan yeah. that want to make movies. And, you know, he's done it for a lot less uh, money than uh, the uh, the big budget fil uh, films. Yeah. You know? And he he does very well, and he knows how to you know uh, bring in uh, interesting characters, interesting cast, and and like I, I said, I mean a lot of people also don't like his attitude. I mean he does it he does a pussy put around. He does he says it how it how it is. Right. Like he's not going to you know just cater and just do you know uh, say what's politically correct. He'll say what's on his mind. And you can argue about it or whatever you want. But the impression I get when I, I see him and see his interviews and when I, I talk to him uh, before this show, uh, the impression I get is, you know, he tells you what he thinks and he's not trying to hide anything. He's not, you know, trying to pretend to be something he's not, which is kind of very, I would say, refreshing. Uh, to see, especially uh, dealing with the film world, especially Hollywood. Right. And he's, yeah, I mean, he's an underdog for sure. He's made these multi-million dollar movies, but he's a dude that kind of he has that real independent way of thinking where he he, fi he finds the money himself, which I got to give him kudos for it. He goes out there, he makes the film and then he goes out there himself and tries to sell it to these bigger distribution companies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, for sure. You know, and to go into the people's opinion, you know, that's great art. When you think of great art, you know what I mean? You got 
you know, great art is a situation where you could have two people approach that art and look at it. And one person could fucking hate it and one person can love it. And that's a sign of great art if you can pull that out of somebody. Because at the end of the day, dude, it's all what you're making people feel. Making people feel something, whether it's hate or love, is a beautiful thing. Because the majority of films you'll watch today, you don't feel anything. Yeah. It's just, okay, it's over. I didn't get anything from it. I don't have any type of emotion behind it at all. It was just there, and now it's not there, and I don't miss it. I'm not thinking about it. It's over. At least with, with Bowles films, you have a, you, you have a, a stance on it. You, we really hate it, but you really love it. Join us as we interview uh, the great UV Bowl and learn about the man, dude. Now, you've seen the films, learn about the man. I got to say, uh, the first movie I saw that uh, you made was actually um, uh, in Name of the King, uh, Dungeon Seeds Tale. And I got to say, I was, uh, I really liked it. I really liked the style. I loved the, uh, all the fantasy elements. And I thought it was a really uh, well put together movie, which unfortunately I don't think got um, the respect that it deserved. And a lot of people, you know, gave it a lot of bad reviews, but I was like, I, I didn't see why, because I mean, it's, it was a fun, I mean, the fun, energetic, and, and I'm a huge uh, fantasy film buff. And it's, it's the kind of, if I was making a fancy film movie, it would have been something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and I gotta say, I really appreciated you know, that film. So how, how was it to, you know, get things together to, uh, to, uh, to make that film? Yeah, I, I think, so what was in the name of the king, the, the, there are some problems to it and some, I think, things they worked out uh, okay. Um, we had script writers first, they put something together and I, I didn't like them. Then I had a different guy, he's actually dead now, but he was more like a motivational speaker guy, whatever. And he said, we need a real hero uh, uh, story. So he brought it and then it was so long. It was like 190 pages. And I felt, okay, uh, are we doing a two part? Or should I do a one long film or whatsoever? And during the process, 20th Century Fox basically um agreed to distribute the film. And then I delivered that what came out later as a director's cut, like a 170 minutes version. And they said, we're not releasing that. You need to give us two hours or we're not doing it. So, and then I cut it down to two hours. Um, and I like the longer version a little more. And the two hours version, yeah, it, I think it did well worldwide in ancillary video, TV. Uh, it was basically shown in every country. But the bad reviews were also because the characters were not well developed and so on. And I felt in the longer version, what is only out in a few countries, most of countries never re- released the longer version, there you have the fleshed out characters, and you have, but you have also a little what I personally feel in Lord of the Rings and all that films, boring, stretched out scenes nobody really needs. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I don't like the two hours version. I I think it plays very well. And after basically the release of In the Name of the King, so many people came out there so long, unnecessary long. Every Avengers film is two and a half hours long. And, And stuff, every, really, basically every big movie now is two hours, 20 minutes, Mm. even if it's a comic book movie or something. And I think I'm a big fan of like, tell something in a hundred page, a hundred minutes and it's over. So, um, but with this specific film, it's the longest film in my career, like uh, lengthwise. And I felt it needs this kind of little Lord of the Rings feeling but it should be still an action film with Jason Statham and, and so on, a lot of uh, uh, moving. So I have to say also, like, a lot a lot of people later contacted me when they finally watched it, mostly in TV, and said, I loved that film. That was totally entertaining. And uh, But the reviewers um, compared it to Lord of the Rings, 
And then they say it sucked in comparison to Lord of the Rings, right? And I always said, yeah, but compare it to the Golden Compass, I think I have the better movie. But the Golden Compass got only half of the bad reviews what we got. So they got like, uh, because of House of the Dead, when we're moving backwards, because of House of the Dead, Alone in the Dark, they were, I was so tainted at that point uh at the reviewers that they only whatever i did they just wanted to destroy it mm. yeah yeah it's a tough deal you know what i mean for sure the um with the critics and stuff where do you like it's almost like they they came to a turning point where they decided they're not going to be fans and then they've just from that point on they were kind of difficult with you you know do you do you remember the exact like turning point with that or like or like uh you know, when that really kind of came into play where you had to worry about like the fact that, and you, you know, everybody goes, oh, just critics, you don't got to worry about them, but you do kind of got to worry about them when they're, when other people go to them for advice on films and such, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was on Alone in the Dark. Yeah. Uh, that was the film. Uh, House of the Dead did good business, was campy, was gory, uh, and it was a little mixed up. And Alone in the Dark was like the downfall, basically. They totally trashed it and uh, said it was a piece of shit, whatever. And then they hated me. So whatever then happened, like Blood Rain, uh, it didn't get any uh, credit, uh, like like credit, you know, where you could say, okay, you know what? Uh, Blood Rain is totally different as Alone in the Dark. And In the Name of the King is totally different as, as Alone in the Dark and Blood Rain. Yeah. So, uh, but they were not willing to judge the film's individual anymore. They were just, oh, it's an overball film. Boom. You know, it was like whatever happened, uh, it got trashed. And I felt that the absurd thing with the raspberries, when I got the raspberry for my life achievement, whatever, yeah. was for uh, Postal, what I think is a sensational film. I love Postal. Right? And yeah. then you get nominated. That showed to me they never watched Postal. It was just like the amalgamation of ball films in the video game base. We 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 have to give the guy the, the life achievement of work. And not even watching Postal, uh, when I when I do like podcasts or talk to reviewers now, like years and years later, most of them agree that Postal is actually maybe the best video game based movie ever made. You know, so. because it's so adequate to the chaotic, anarchistic game yeah. uh, as you can do it. You know, and, and I think also what didn't help me at that point was that all the really shitty even more expensive video game based films like World of Warcraft or Prince of Persia were at that point not existing. Yeah. Right. And and so I they uh, I couldn't compare it to them and say, look, they spent triple of what I spent on in the name of the king, and I have bigger cast and yeah. a better film. So for what they're spending all that money. So and that is the thing. It's it's like uh, that came too late. It it came too late, and then people were like focused on their opinion and continue with that opinion. And Uh, I mean, you are watching films like me. I'm a a film freak. I watch everything. And I think there are a lot of reversed director careers where you have people that did one or two good films in the beginning and then they basically totally flatted out and made only crap. Mm -hmm. And they're still getting celebrated as the total geniuses. And you watch the film yourself and you think, what the fuck? This guy like Terrence Malick or whatever, where you think like, what the fuck is wrong? And just shy is total bullshit what that guy filmed for yeah. like the last 10, 12 years. Sure. And before the Sin Red Line, Badlands, whatever, he did good films, you know? But this guy is getting like the pass on whatever they shoot and nobody rips them to 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 or Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, there will be blood, boogie nights, masterpieces, you know, and then you have like the master or whatever, like some movies, they were so bad, like the Phantom Menace that was Daniel Day-Lewis, horrible, you know, and you think like, but but they never got, they even got Oscar nominations for that films, where, where a normal viewer looks at this and say, no, it's total crap. If I would did the Phantom Thread or whatever the film was with Daniel Day-Lewis, 
yeah. they would completely demolish that film into the ground. And and uh, and in my case, I, I I started on the wrong foot, and I could do whatever I wanted. I I never got the the the, the credit back. You know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. And Paul Thomas Anderson is like a really good um, example yeah. of that because you got like Boogie Nights, you've got Hard Eight, you've got, you know, There Will Be Blood. I like The Master, but after The Master, like that in, incoherent Vice movie was no good. Phantom Thread was no good. And even yeah. the Licorice Pizza movie that everybody is, is loving. I watched it the other day and I'm like, Ugh. it's very disappointing how far he fell, but they'll always show him respect. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a weird, it's definitely a weird vibe for sure. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, it kind of reminds me back in, in school where you have someone who like in the beginning, you know, gets all A's and all that. And then, you know, afterwards they throw in shit work and not work and, and then, but they're still getting the, the accolades, they're still getting the grades. And then you have someone who, you know, didn't do such great at the beginning. And then even though he's getting better and he's doing better stuff, then, you know, the guy who uh, used to get A's, he's not given the respect that uh, he deserves for, you know, trying to improve himself and, and be better. I mean, the thing is that I think it's it's more of a journey for, like, uh, actors, for directors and all that, and for artists in general, is it's all the journey that you can start off and maybe something isn't as good as you want or hoped. Uh, but uh, when you go down, you know, years down the line, that, you know, you you learn from your mistakes and you improve upon it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of uh, your stuff, like uh, 1968 Tunnel Rats. I love that movie. I think it's one of the best war movies I've seen that really kind of kind of uh, just ex yes. encapsulates uh, the, you know, the, the meaningless of war, in my opinion. No, I, I, no, I 100% agree. And I uh, I think over the years I did 34 films and I'm uh, still self-critical. I know where flaws were, where things didn't work out, where the pressure was different, where you had to shoot, even if the script was not finished, stuff like this. It's also what people, they dig a little filmmaking. They know that there's sometimes stuff what is not transparent to the audience, what forces you to uh, to do stuff because otherwise the project falls apart. Yeah, you know where where you say where the actor says I can do it, but we have to start shooting in three weeks, and you know, and you have financiers. They say you need to do that this year, uh, otherwise I'm not backing you. And so, and then you run after time, and you prep too fast, and you uh, and and the stuff is not full developed. And I see that mistakes, but. That is the film industry. And not everybody is like Steven Spielberg, right? The way you can do whatever the fuck you want, right. you know, and you still will get the actors when you want to shoot. And when after four years, the script is ready. So, and that is, but it's not the reality of 99% of the filmmakers. Yeah. It's uh, things falling apart or you have things like say, look, we need to do this. Uh, we have a slot for that film, but only if, you, if you're quick, whatever. And um, that is, I think that is stuff what the normal audience don't know, but what also a lot of reviewers don't know and what, what where they also uh, don't care. But I think the school stuff, what you said, was the best example. Because let's say you have a guy who's doing only A's, right? If he really goes on a D level, the teacher thinks he is wrong. So he gives him a B minus for a D work, but the guy who had a C to start with will never get the A. Yeah. You know, no matter what, what, what you would do, they say, look, I judged that guy. I, I said, he's not so good. I've wrote it in two reviews. I cannot say I was in total error with Tunnel Rats, you know, or Salt on Wall Street or Rampage, you know, to say, look, I was actually wrong that thing is good. And I had only 
in U in US with Art Edinger. He had the like a horror uh, magazine from New York. He wrote, uh, I think that was during Postal or whatever, a big article about me. And he he wrote like, he is one of the totally misjudged directors of all time. Mm. Yeah, he wrote, you barely had it that somebody got so much hate. But half of his movies are extremely good and important. And and uh, in, in Germany, I had a, a situation in the bigger newspaper, The Welt, what would be like the Washington Post, whatever, like this kind of size in Germany, where a guy called me, also unusual, because in Germany, I got bashed the whole time too. And then the guy called me and said, during the lockdown, he watched all 33, at that point, ball films. And I asked him, like, you're not, you're kidding, right? I said, like, you're totally, like, lying to me you know and he said no 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 he said i watched all the ball films from german front movie on and i want to write a whole page in that newspaper about you and he was a very uh, uh uh let's say the article was very let's say realistic he, he he hated alone in the dark he he hated blood rain as an example right but he said rent page one is for him one of the best films he watched at all. He said it's in his top 10 of all times because nobody ever did a movie like this. Right. It was so ruthless, so sarcastic, so brutal. And uh, he said no studio would ever do this because they would think like, are you insane? Mm -hmm. You're celebrating a mass murderer, right? So, but I think that made the film yeah. that you like Bill Williams. You know, that is the thing that, and, and, and similar to, natural born killers, you know, where you had this kind of like, you loved the ride, right. uh, you know? So, and, and there are rarely films like this, they are like unmoral, but I think you get it where, where it's coming from. And and um, so he wrote like that, that was one of them, he loved the four, he loved Tunnel Rats. And he said, you really cannot just uh, um, flatten out over Ball's career like so many directors that did five films and disappeared or three films and disappeared. He said that guy made over 30 films. Yeah. So you cannot just act like he's a nobody who didn't get anything achieved, right? And it was for me in Germany, a very important article because a lot of other reviewers re reading this, not watching my films then, but they at least read it and saw that at least one guy put the hours in and watch the films. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah. That is also what I always said to reviewers when they attack me for, for shit. I did that Hanau film in Germany, my last film about a terror attack in Germany. I got so much flag for it. People like went ballistic on me. And they, um, uh, um, and I said also like, you pre, you Google me, you saw I got the raspberry. Now you think I cannot make a film about a terror attack in Germany. Like in Hanau in Germany, a guy shot nine migrants and then himself and the mother. So it's a real case. And so I did the film, plays all in it one night where the guy did it. And similar to the Breivik guy in Norway, whatever, he put out a YouTube video before and said like, uh, we have to kill the Muslims. Like he flipped, like he was a like a real like hardcore Nazi guy. Yeah? yeah. So, and I show what happened in that night, and then I got totally criticized from all the migrant, the families, the mayor of Hanau, and all the press that I gave basically a shit about the victims and put the perpetrator in the middle of my film. And I said, yeah, but that is what is the interesting part. I mean, I don't do a documentary. I did a feature film. And in the feature film, you cannot have the guy who's standing at the kiosk and get shot in the, shot in the head being the lead. Maybe you can do, but I'm not. Right. And I said, if you would watch my films, I don't know another director who digged deeper into Amok runs as me. I did it in Heart of America. I, I, I did it I did it in Run Amok, my third film, what I did in Germany. I did it in Rampage in all three parts. I did it in the South of Wall Street. It's a subject matter I'm fascinated by. Why people snap? And, and I said, 
without the manifesto from the guy, I would never did the film because then I would have no information. But right. the guy wrote 30 pages that put uploaded them and did various videos he uploaded. And I said, that made for me the film uh, to, to have an actor playing it then, you know, because that makes you understand as an audience why people do this and shocks you. It shocks you uh, like when you have like that domino stone who falls right. and then people go for it and you have it in U.S., every four weeks yeah you You know know, i think that's a big i think you know i think you're controversial in a good way you know what i mean the way that like older filmmakers would make movies that would make you think and they would give you failings and you'd be like wow they're really doing something with this film i I wonder if it leans into that direction where humanity always hates to see itself being ugly you know what i mean so when you're kind of showing them that i wonder if they take umbrage with the fact that you're showing them how ugly humanity is you know what i mean yeah. And there was another issue with the with the families. So the families were basically bashing me, the survivors and whatever. And then the, the, the press jumped right on it, like the Vogue culture people, right? How could Paul make a film where the families of the vit- victims are not happy with? And I, and I said, look, we have to stay here with the truth. The truth is that the families sued the government for the massacre and won money. And they say it was the fault of the police, mm. of the ambulance drivers, that their son is dead or whatever, right? So, and I show that it was not the fault. The, it was a lonely wolf killing. I mean, you, you cannot, it's hard to say, like the school shooting in US where the police were not doing anything, where the police now gets charged for. I mean, if you're 45 minutes waiting till everybody's shot and you're there, then you are, it's your fault too, that so many people got killed, right? So the police was scared to go in a classroom. But in Hanau, he drove in a, in a shisha bar, like a, a smoke, like a shisha bar, shot six or seven people, heard a few more. And then he jumped in his car, within a minute, he was in and out, and drove through a kiosk, like a normal kiosk, and went in and shot another five, six people, Few survived, so we were nine dead in the end, six heavily injured. And then from there, he drove to his house where where he shot his mother because he didn't want her mother being like going through the public disgrace. Shame, yeah. The yeah. shame. So he shot her and shot himself. When the police arrived, they were dead. So, and showing it in the film, it's it's even out in us now on apple google and amazon so you can stream uh, stream it with subtitles and but i i felt it's important to show what actually happened to also clear the facts yeah. the police arrived the first shisha bar when he was already killing everybody in the kiosk that was very fast right you know it's uh, i mean what the fuck? you cannot blame the police yeah. because what they said is the police were nazis and supported him in the killing in not doing anything but you can do only something if you're there. Yeah. You know, if you're like a kilometer behind the perpetrator and he was a very good shooter, he was like in a shooting club. So, and he was not standing to 10 minutes in the kiosk. He walked in, shot, everybody was running around and went out. So, um, and they hated me for it. Then I showed actually what actually happened, you know? And I said, of course, in interviews, I said, I, I think, the police was in a way uh, overwhelmed, helpless, and not fast enough. And but you cannot say that it's the police fault or the police were the police was with him doing all 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 the stuff, you know. Uh, so, but but I mean, you know, it's what you said. It's like whatever I do, they find an angle to bash me for it. But there are a lot of people that appreciate also what I'm doing. Right. You know, I get a lot of emails saying, you're not doing the bullshit like everybody else. Like uh, uh, you do things and you're not giving in. You yeah. know, that is the thing also what I didn't did when the, when the families attacked me in public, all the journalists wanted that I apologize to them. I said, there's nothing to apologize. I said like, th- there are films about real situations from JFK to whatever. Right. 
you know, and like as a filmmaker, you can do whatever the fuck you want. That was a public event. And if I want to sh- uh, film Littleton again or whatever, it's like it's a it's a public uh, 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 view on, on something. And you cannot taint yourself with opinions from totally like uh, uh, um, the victim, the victim's family. So you, you have to just go through the material, what actually happened, and the witness statements, and then do it the way uh, it actually it actually happened. It's like it becomes pop culture, unfortunately, and it's kind of everybody's story. You know, like in Heart of America, I know it was heavily influenced by Columbine. Yeah. And uh, even in the Columbine days, like I remember that there was that whole hold off of the police too, where like they didn't go in the school for like a day or whatever, and there was like. Um, I feel there was a kid that was shot like on the grounds outside and the way that the family found out that their kid was dead by a helicopter shot showing their kid dead on the ground. You know what I mean? So there was a lot of outrage over that. But yeah, it's like you don't really know what you're getting into. So it's like, are you going to run into open fire? No, no one's going to run into open fire. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, but uh, that was the thing what I felt about the, what was that, Uva or whatever, like the last killing where the police didn't went in the classroom. Yeah. So if you know there's a guy who has like 19 hostages in the classroom and you cannot look into the classroom. So basically you have to blow the door off and go in with shields, you know, and you have like little holes in the shield where you can shoot through. First of all, if I would be the police commander, I would think also that will cost half of that kid's life. I mean, I, I mean, I would assume the guy would just randomly fire into the crowd, and before you take him out, he had a mashing gun, right? So he had an automatic weapon. So I mean, if you have like twenty kids sitting in a corner, uh, so I would be very scared too. I I don't think the police was. I think the police was too scared to go in. That it's right that they fire them, but at the same time, it was from the beginning on not necessarily successful to kick the door in and hope for the best. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you could put the gas in that everybody's knocked out, including the kids, that would be the safest way, for example. You know, like that when everybody's falling apart and like whatever, and he's out too, and then you can arrest him. That would be the best, but I don't think they had that. They didn't have that opportunity. And also, if you, if you, put, a, if you put gas in a room, of course, you have the problem that he's still having a minute before before he starts sleeping to shoot right. everybody. You know, like you can say, "Oh fuck us," you know. So, and that is the thing where when when you go through, that is also what I always uh, uh, liked in a lot of films I did. It's like doing something logical is a lot of times it's a big advantage to to redo a situation for real as to just write an article about a massacre or to report in TV about a massacre or making a documentary about it. If you physically recreate the situation, it brings, I think, more, you know? So it, 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 it actually, the police should actually do that a lot of times because then you, when you actually have it uh, like a, uh, uh, with, with actors redoing, re- uh, re- uh, reacting, you feel there's something off where you feel like that cannot happen this way, that it's, it's totally absurd what's going on here. I had that various times when I did films. I did a film, my second film was Barsch on Murder in Geneva. What was a prime minister in Germany, from a part of Germany, he was found dead in a hotel room in Geneva in Switzerland. And he was in the bathtub, completely dressed. He had a towel on his hand and slept. Like if he was basically in a sleeping position in the bathtub, dead. I needed an overdoses of drugs. So, but then, uh, like, and I did the film about it. There were a lot of documentaries about it because whole Germany talked about it, but I did a film with actors and I showed three different versions based on the facts. And I came to the conclusion that it was murder, what his family said, because of a few things. He ordered a bottle of wine to his room. They said that the the people in the hotel said there was nobody in in his room. And there was no guests in his room. So, but he ordered a bottle with two glasses to his room. The wine bottle was empty in his garbage with one glass broken. 
but he had no alcohol in his blood. And uh, uh, there is, was a hotel where you had air conditioning, but you couldn't open the window. So you could not throw any evidence out of the window. Then in the, when they checked him out, he had so much drugs already in his system that the drugs he had additional in his belly, he couldn't took himself because he had so much in his blood already on drugs, he was out. Mm. And he definitely don't arrange to be full dressed in a suit in a nice bus top laying there like he's relaxing in the bus top. I mean, what the fuck? You know, and I said, like, when you, when you rebuild it, and he had a big, like, a hematome on the back of the head, like somebody knocked him out from behind with a heavy uh, thing. And so we went to Geneva. We went in the same hotel room. We looked it all up. And then we found out also that there were other rooms. There were people booked in, but the identity nobody could clear up. You know, so... And then a year later, everybody thought we are total crazy idiots doing that film, right? And a year later, it turned out he was involved in weapon deals. So he was a dirty politician. Mm. But his career went down the drain for some totally different reason. But he was a security risk now because of the weapon deals he did. So what I assume is they lured him to the hotel room and got rid of him and covered it up as a suicide. And the government in Germany totally felt for it because they were the security risk. They, they, because Germany did in the older times where the wall was still there, illegal weapon deals with Eastern Germany. So Germany was making weapons and they were not allowed to sell it to communist countries, but they wanted to make the money. So they sold it to their own German other side who were communist at that point, right? Because Germany was split in half, basically, or two thirds, one third. So, and the, the East Germans, they had no money, they needed money. So they used these deals, and he was a middleman on that deals. So, uh, and then that, that all came out a year later, and like when the film came out, came out everybody said, Bald, you're a total idiot. The film totally flopped. And two years later, when the film ran in TV, I said, like, uh, uh, what do you say now? Like, I was full of shit? Or was it, like, not that we, in recreating the death, proved that he couldn't did it alone? So your whole bullshit, like, he killed himself in the bus top, was impossible. Yeah. It was just impossible. So somebody had to give him the drugs. Somebody had to hit him in the head. So, uh, you know, and I said he had no alcohol in his fucking blood, but the bottle of wine was empty. So how's this working out? I mean, it's impossible. Right. Yeah. You know, so, you know, and that is the thing. It's like uh, um, a lot of a lot of things are not the way people think first. And uh, that is the same with the reviewers. I think a lot of films are prejudged uh, and they change over time. Yeah. You know, I have that with a lot of my favorite films too, where where well, I love Jaws. Right? So I think Jaws is one of the best films ever made. Sure. And in the beginning it was just a spectacle spectacle with a shark shark. Yeah. You know, but I think it's so much more and it's it's a film as at, at his best, like like uh, uh even if it was so primitive done with the shark, it worked way better as any CGI shit I ever saw after. Yeah. You know, yes. so yeah. I wonder. Uh, I'm waiting for the Bob Saget documentary because the whole deal with him, dude, fucking suppose it was natural causes or something, but it looked like somebody hit him in the head with a bat or something like that. There'll be like a story of that later in life. That was a crazy, crazy. Yeah. But with, with Spielberg, the thing with Spielberg is if you look at his filmography, he's got films that bombed that they just don't talk about. You know what I mean? And I think it goes into like a weird high school thing. It's almost like to go back to the Hollywood being high school thing. It's like the, the teacher might go, oh, I'm going to give this movie a D or I'm going to give this movie a B. And I think the principal and coach step into the picture, a.k.a. the studios and be like, nah, you need to give him a better review. You know what I mean? That's our that's like our, our money making man. We need to you need to tell everybody that his movie's great, even if it isn't. You know, so it's like a, that weird politics in Hollywood is horrible. It's like it's. The politics in Hollywood, they really shouldn't be 
politics, you know, they're, they're trying to kind of kill off the art form of it, you know what I mean, and make it more cookie cutter, safe films, which is unfortunate, you know what I mean? Yeah, and also I think, for, for example, for me, I'm so happy that Quentin Tarantino exists, right? So it's, it's like this kind of like, it's not that I think Tarantino is the greatest guy ever as a person. I think he's a kind of an asshole, right? So I heard people are working with him and he's full of himself, whatever. But as a filmmaker, he is not bored and deliver things he doesn't want to deliver. Right. He's like, in a way, very stick with his plan and, and comes across with films that are just uh, different. And that is why I love that Quentin Tarantino exists and that he doesn't start making Netflix Netflix series or something, right? So, and with Spielberg, I think that he, um, after Schindler's List, he basically was all like a studio chef. For sure. You know, he's doing the Jurassic Park animation show, whatever. Like, but as a director, Schindler's List was this kind of like, the last hooray mm. and then it was like it didn't it didn't matter anymore it's like uh, money making and and just concentrating on making money and making big big films or films that nobody gives shit about whatever but um but he did before yeah like starting with duel duel uh, uh you know he did before amazing films yeah and et uh, uh, uh so he did a lot of films i love yeah. And I love Jaws over, uh, like the most for, from his films, but of course, Shinta's this was an absolute masterpiece. And um, so I give him his credit, and I'm happy that the Martin Scorsese, like that, this kind of people exist still. Of course, because otherwise you wouldn't have any personalities anymore. I mean, nobody gives a shit who directs The Gray Man, right? <laughs> on Netflix or something. I mean, it's just like. <laughs> uh, uh, all that the Avengers directors or whatever, I think they are just fulfilling, um, like it's like a computer programmer, you know. It's it's just kind of like that. It's, I don't think that it's directing anymore in a way. I, I've heard it uh, equate to like fast food, like bubble gum, like bubble gum music, bubble gum movies. It's fast food where like you can go out and eat McDonald's. And then you're going to feel like shit, and just, you know what I mean? But you go eat a real meal, you know what I mean? And you feel like a real film, watch a real film, you actually get something from it. Whereas in like this fast food films, it's just all this flash and all that. And then it's over at the end of it. You're like, I mean, it was two, two and a half hours, but I mean, and uh, you know, I didn't really get anything of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the big thing about uh, most of the films coming out now is the big tentpole ones and Hollywood and all that. Uh, you know, and I understand people say, you know, you go to the movies to be entertained, to, you know, to escape reality. But the fact is movies are more than that. You have to, you can have movies like your Avengers where you can sit back, waste a few hours and, you know, be in a place that doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. But when you have movies like the movies that, that you make, it's very visceral. I mean, it, you don't, a lot of times you don't walk away with any happy feelings, but, but you walk away thinking about what you just saw, thinking about the movie itself. And I mean, you can say the same thing about like Taxi Driver and yeah. a lot of the other, you know, classic films that, I mean, I can see still, let's say 80 years from now, people still be talking about Taxi Driver but I doubt they'll be talking about the latest Avengers movie. Right. They're not even yeah. talking about it anymore. Yeah, because you, you need to make, you got to have the meat and the potatoes and also the fast food. And and you got to, you know, push the envelope and, and, and try new and different things to really get people to think and talk about issues. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I feel also as a film geek in a way that the Oscar winning movies or whatever, they are like not even half of the quality of the films of the 80s. Right. It's, it's just like there are films for Oscars nominated where you watch them and you think like, who gives a shit? Right. 
you watch whatever you know like I minari mean, or whatever the films like one even and you think okay compare that to dances with wolves or something you know where you had the feeling like you watch a real epic again like an old john ford or william wilder film but 30 40 years later and you know and you felt the heart in it and and and, and everything and uh and then you watch some like moonlight uh, or whatever, like this kind of films that are not bad, but right. you think this is a, gets a nominated for the best film of the year. The film industry has a huge problem, and you yeah. think of what the fuck, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I think also like take a South on Wall Street as an example. Yeah. I think if Matt Damon would play the Dominic Purcell part, it would be a smash hit, and it would get nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. Because it was the only really furious film about revenge after the 2008 disaster, where thousands of people killed themselves, losing all their money in the real estate crisis, right? And the banks got, got bailed out and even richer. And the people lost everything they had. And, and uh, I was surprised that... I'm still happy even with Dominic Purcell, but if it would get a bigger star, everybody would talk about that film because it was 10 times better as Wall Street Part 2. Yeah. For example, what sucked, you know, <laughs> so uh, in comparison to Wall Street 1, what well, was a masterpiece, you know? So yeah. I love Oliver Stone. To go with like the, the Academy Award movies, it's, it, they're pushing more of an agenda an actual art you know what i mean like you watch them and it could be based off of you know sexual orientation or a race thing and I th it's lazy filmmaking because they know that people are already invested in those things so like they kind of rely on people's feelings on those things to kind of make them feel as opposed to really going somewhere interesting and new and maybe it might upset somebody you know what i mean but it's like upsetting people you know it's not always a bad thing you know what I mean? It's kind of a good thing sometimes when it makes people think and go, oh, well, you know, I never really thought of it this way or I never seen it through that perspective. You know what I mean? It's important stuff. And Hollywood, they, they're very nowadays, it seems like nobody wants to offend anybody. Everybody wants everybody to be you know, happy and cool and collected and not think that not thinking is a big thing. You know what I mean? Unfortunately. Yeah. And I think it's horrible. I mean, I'm a totally uh, uh, against any quotes like you need to have but, but today if you would create whatever you create and you don't have black hispanos uh natives transgender whatever in that round of people you're done yeah. like you don't even have to send it anybody because they say what the fuck you did like a film where white males playing the lead yeah. you know so it, and it, it's so stupid uh, I, for me, it was always uh, you need the right person for the job, and you need the right actor or actress to do it. You know, and it's also like with the same pay. When it came with with the same pay, that is the most absurd thing. You know, when female soccer player players want the same like the male soccer players, but they don't close the two billion TV contract a year. They are not. Nobody gives a shit about their play besides some world championships from time to time. And the same with actresses. When I see you know, Jessica, no, what was it? The daughter from Ron Howard, how, how uh, at the Jurassic Park that she finally got the same money uh, as, as the, the main guy. Yeah, but nobody gave a shit if she would be in the movie or not. Right. You know, man, you have stars and you have people that they exchangeable and nobody misses that. Yeah. You know, so and that is the thing. I think it's completely absurd to ask for the same money only because you're a woman in a TV show. Uh, it, it, it's it's just like, uh, how's the market working then, right? I mean, Air Jordan was Air Jordan, and he got so much money because he got like I don't know eight championships or seven or eight. You know, like that is the right. thing. Like, and I, I and I feel that is now spread everywhere. Mm -hmm. Where, where also employees working somewhere are so scared shitless to do a mistake that now we get only like the middle ground, like the total bullshit 
and they don't even know what to do. I give you an example. I have two good uh, uh, developments for like a TV series. One is in the name of the king as a TV series, like a reboot, and the other one is like a um, about the farmer wars in Europe. It's a comic book, Captain Fight, a German comic book, very uh, very high end. Uh, uh, and I made uh, the, the the TV series idea about it. It's because the it, it was basically this: the French Revolution happened three hundred years before in Germany, but the people lost. Mm. That is the reason nobody ever made anything about it because it was a huge massacre and they're getting wiped out by the kings yeah. <laughs> and the army. But it's yeah, a little yeah. like Braveheart, right? The Braveheart story. So yeah. I developed these things that were amazing pictures. So then Disney Plus opened in Germany a German production office. So I sent it to them. Then the guy emailed me back. He said, oh, there are great ideas, but we're looking more for German films with German actors who socially matter. So then I brought him back, but you work for Disney Plus. Right. I mean, if I get that answer from Netflix, you know, but I said, like, what you actually want? Like, I mean, if you film a Nazi film now at Disney Plus playing now, you get fired. Right. Well, I wrote him an open letter. I said, look, that is totally absurd that you say, I mean, in the name of the king was worldwide in TV. If you do that as a TV show on Disney Plus, I said, it would totally score. It would totally work out, right? And uh, he didn't answer my, my email was last week where it came up. But I feel like the people don't know anymore what their job is. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, and you have that everywhere. It's like they are so pissing in their pants because it comes back to them. If you do anything was politically incorrect, anything what is radical, uh, um, you know, or anything where they are, don't fit a woman in as a lead actress or whatever, you know, it's like they say, okay, I say, I don't see here diversity, I whatever, right? And you think about it, I just tried to tell a story. And, uh, yeah. you know, if, if you make a film about Stalingrad, uh, in the Second World War, you cannot expect a lot of women and definitely no black people, right? So, I mean, it's that is the fact. Right. Or forget it, yeah? But then they prefer, and you see that non-stop in TV now, to make total fantasy bullshit where all races are mixed up, like Bridgerton or whatever, right? They feel that it's so cool that the Queen of England is black. But in a way, they're rewriting history with this in a way that it's totally idiotic. Yeah. You know, I'm not playing Gone with the Wind anymore. Uh, I mean, look, when the film was filmed. Right. Yeah. You know, how can you flip out on the film that it was political, totally incorrect? No, at the time where it was shot, it was completely normal to, to do the film and nobody felt he's a racist to be in the film or something. Yeah, it's you true. Know? I mean, it, it's, film, it's history. It's like, I, I hate to do to change history only because people cannot take the history anymore. Right. You know, so I did, yeah, I show you. I did in Germany was a book uh, came out for me uh, like in, in summer. And it's like the, the, the title is uh, why nobody uh, wants to say the truth anymore. Germany between cancel culture, political correctness, and the new... Uh, Basically, that that they are uh, pussies in in holding back their real their real uh, op uh, uh, opinions. Yeah. And interesting was so we were two weeks on Amazon number one in Germany, so it sold very good. But I didn't get one review. Hmm. So uh, there was a no review in no newspaper, and the publisher is a big publisher in Germany, like a big book publisher. They're releasing like fifty books a month, and he said he, they never had that. Normally, everybody wants the free books and they're writing a review. And they said, in your case, nobody wanted to write a review because nobody wants to agree with me. <laughs> you know, if you write in a newspaper, Ball is totally right. That is way, way too much vogue culture now or, you know, to do the gender bullshit, whatever, right? So, and it's like, uh, if, if as soon you write this, that you agree with me, you are done. Like, your job is gone. Right. And that is the problem now. It is. Yeah. You know, I think future generations of film fans are going to look back 
the way that we were just talking about how people look back at Gone in the Wind and go, that's offensive. I think future future film generation will look back at this time and because of the PC culture and the watering down of stuff, they're going to be offended by the stuff that's happening now, believe it or not. You know what I mean? But they're going to be like, well, you're you're kind of, you know, you had the opportunity to make this good movie and you kind of, you know, go deep with it or whatever, but you made like, you just really want to make a political statement that everybody else is making. So, you know, why do you really have to do it type five? And I think uh, like the art is kind of, been t- it's more, you know, the show business, of course, so there's a business and that's a huge deal to it. Unfortunately, you know, that's where I think a lot of investors uh, in, in their opinions, I think is a big kind of, issue with the direction of uh films and especially this the hollywood system everybody kind of wants to fit into it and it's all you almost have you have to play the game to fit into their system but i like with you you're more of an independent dude you're kubrickian kind of you'll take take the money make the film and then turn it into like the distributor type deal which i think is the best way to kind of do it you know yeah look when you have I'm very sad about people like Seth Rogen or Jonah Hill or whatever, and they are yeah. now ashamed of super bad or something. Right. And you seem like, are you insane? Right. You both would be nothing without yeah. that offensive movies in the beginning right. of your career. And, and uh, uh, I mean, there would be unknown actors now, right? Or unknown right. Uh, actors, right? And, and I think that it's a shame. They should totally double down on it. I'm totally, I'm totally proud of Postal. Oh, for sure. It was like, gave shit to everybody, to every religion, every skin color, whatever, post to give a shit to everything. And that is what I'm proud of, to say, right. like, who gives a fuck? And and that is the thing, What what? but this behavior there from Seth Rogen or whatever, I think is dead wrong, because I 100% believe that he lies. Yeah, for sure. You know, that he, that he personally think it's still super funny. Mm-hmm. Right, but he's lying to look better in public, and that is what I hate. You cannot do this. You have to say no. That is my film. Uh, uh, it, 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 it they wrote it also, and you know, and uh, uh, I love that film. I love Naked Gun and Airplane and all that stuff. And yeah. it's a shame that stuff like this doesn't get played anymore. Because you see, they're not getting played anymore, right? So they're totally like scared to play that shit. And I think there were classics of comedy. And uh, if if you laugh about something, you cannot really be a racist. Right. You know, I I think you are like the laughing is individual worldwide. And in good comedy, it has to hurt. And you can make a joke about everything. You know, and I think all that comedies were very like even out with making fun out of any p- p- skin color and whatever. They were not racist at all. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's with stand up comedy the same when they're getting censored and censored and censored. And then they don't even know what, what joke they can do without like getting canceled five minutes after their, their appearance. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And with the Seth Rogen thing, I mean, that he kind of he turned on Franco. Franco had like accusations against him, and I remember he like exiled Franco. Like he's like, I don't include me with him. He's a bad dude, and it's it's a weird vibe because I almost feel like they both probably indulged in that behavior, and one of them got caught. You know what I mean? So like now, well, I gotta say he's the devil. I can't fuck with them. Yeah, you know, I think Franco had better better uh, more choices to get better looking girls too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can pick as a girl you yeah. want to you want to go with james franco home or with says rogan you take franco so you don't want that laugh during orgasm <laughs> 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 but uh you know to go back to postal postal is probably my favorite film of yours you know I remember the first film of yours I ever seen was House of the Dead, which I appreciated a lot. I thought it had some really scary moments. And I remember that 360 shot blew my mind apart because I remember that was right around the time that I was like getting gung ho about making films and seeing that and being like, wow, that's a beautiful shot. Do you remember, was that like a gigantic setup technically for that shot yeah. or what, how long that did that take? That was basically the first uh, and a copy of the Matrix setup. From yeah, Matrix, yeah. Right, where you had 360 little cameras uh, uh, rotating around and then uh, filming. And I had a German company, Electrofilm, 
And I said, well, we had so much like trouble there, right? So they, this guys built the cameras and we were shooting night times. And they said, I told them like, so you have to start early in the morning. So when we, when it gets dark, 14 hours later, yeah. I want to start filming. And they were not done at 2 a.m. And we were like, because the rig was everywhere. So you couldn't film anything from the fighting in front of the house. So I said, like, yeah, but it was the camera rig here. So I'm, I need to shoot the fucking matrix shots we scheduled, right? So, and nothing happened. And then at whatever, 2.30 a.m., they did the first shot. And it was the guy with the axe. They did the double flip, like a flip and throw the axe. And there he was on ropes, of course. So they pulled him backwards into the camera rig. Like 80 cameras fell. And I like, oh, my God. I said, like, because I know how long it took for them to get the cameras ready. Yeah. So then I yelled at them and said, like, you, you bring the cameras back up. In 10 minutes, it's the next shot. Like, I yelled with them. I said, don't start even a fucking bullshit anymore with, like, measuring it. I said, put the cameras back up. We want to keep shooting. So and then at 6 a.m., when the when 6.30 a.m., the, the light came back up. It was all over. So we, we got in as fast we could, that shot. But I like it that you appreciate it because... In the big battle in front of the house were a lot of unbelievable technical effects, yeah. not only practical effects and, and blood effects. We had that turntable where the camera, where they were on a wood thing and the camera was like driving around them. Yeah. Then we had the 360 matrix camera set up and really high end stuff. And when we blow up the house, that was really like 250 kilogram of explosive like blowing up it was a massive explosion like john sleep he did uh, uh i robot and other films he said he never did an explosion like this. that was the biggest explosion he ever did and um you know when, when you have people and later like shit piece of shit whatever and i said like no of course the script was not like schindler's list right but it's house of the dead i mean uh it's the game where you just right. shoot zombies. And I think the big battle in front of the house comes as close as to a video game you can ever get. And um, Sega liked it. Like the video game company from the, the, the real bosses from Japan, they loved the film. Yeah. They loved it. You know, it was also in Japan, Japan very successful. And, and um, yeah, but they, they, I don't know, the people hated it from the beginning on. And... Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know what it is. But I think also in retrospective, why I got a lot of times this critics bashing is that I never was part, as you said, of the system. You know, I never had a Hollywood agent, never a manager, never a PR. You know, like I was just like making films, raising money, making films and selling them. And it looks like that if you're not part of all this kind of you walk somewhere the red carpet, do you live there with them? You know, you go to the power breakfast with an agent or manager. If that never happens with you, mm -hmm. I was obscure for them. Like they were like, and, and at the same time, of course, the agents and managers and all that people, if you're in the system, they protect you. Right. They call the press, the Hollywood reporter, say, look, that film is not so bad as you think. So when you write the review, you know, like stuff like this. And that call never happened. So yeah. they could bash me and bash me and bash me. And there was no uh, repercussions for that. There was no call from any agent or studio uh, giving them shit for bashing somebody. So, and, and I think that was maybe a mistake for me that I never went and lived in Hollywood or for a year or something and tried to play the game. Right. But I did. I, I hated Hollywood. Right. You know, the phony people there and all the the... the this kind of fake conversations. And uh, I think the longest I was in Los Angeles was three weeks one time. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to get out of there. It's like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. It was like, everybody was so full of shit. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah. yeah, you know, it, it's the mentality. It's also, I think I come from a small town in Germany. It's like when you grow up total normal and you don't have it in you. Hmm. You know, because well, when you really look yeah. into a lot of actors, 
whatever Drew Barrymore, whatever. Like, but but I tell you, half of the actors had any connections before already with the father, the Ron Howard and Clinton. You know, like uh, whatever. Like they, they are, they are, it's, it's not a lot of people. They're totally outsiders making it in Hollywood. There right. are a lot of people. The uncle was the agent from William Morris, and then you know, like the whole Nicolas Cage, Francis Ford Coppola, whatever. Like you know, it's all this kind of connected. Yeah. You know. Even um, like War of Worldcraft, which I think is the worst, you know, video game movie of all time. That's David Bowie's son who directed that. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I know. He, cha- no he yeah. changed. I always say he changed his name, but you know that you know David Bowie made the phone calls. And realistically, it's <laughs> like if you get a good crew behind you, that's kind yeah. of a huge part of it. Like I've been on independent sets where the director literally laid on the ground outside while everybody else did the work you know what i mean so like it's proof that if you hire the right dp ad's you know what i mean you they could pretty much direct the film for you like i don't i'm not with that but like if somebody was to come into it from maybe a family thing they they know they just really have to show up and the good people around them will kind of make the film you know what i mean yeah when you have i when when i shot alone of the dark the next yeah. It was X Men, like it was like right next door. Yeah, and you heard Hal Berry screaming with Brian Singer, and Brian Singer was never there because really? he, like I think uh, Brian Singer, I mean, he started his career unbelievable strong, right? But but he turned into like a perverted pedophile yeah. fucker <laughs> who was under drugs the whole time for real. I mean, Brian right. Singer is piece of shit total yes. piece of shit like brett ratner or people like this they're pieces of shit right so and he was driving with his ferrari around and later all the stories came out like he was in the nightclubs and the gay nightclubs and all that stuff and had like 15 years old boys in his hotel room and but we were the whole time like working and a lot of crew from x-men was hanging around our studio just watching yeah you know, because there was nothing happening. Right. Because they spent on X Men, whatever, five times more as Alone in the Dark. And there was like, if he came or not, nobody really knew it. And then nothing was happening, you know. And if I would be, this also, by the way, a lot of studios have so weak producers, they never go against the director, you know. But if I'm the producer of, of uh, uh, X Men, was Warner. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I would fire that guy. I would say, like, no, you don't have to come at all anymore. You're a fucking idiot. <laughs> and your, your your AD is now directing the film, you know. And then of course I would get fired from Warner Brothers. Right. You know, he would call his agent, whatever. But I think in earlier years, where whatever a Jack Warner run the studio himself, or you know, all that people, Blue Dawn, whatever, you know, like the people that were real entrepreneurs, they would said. I back up ball a hundred percent. You know, when you say like this guy gets like millions of dollars to do his job and comes every day, seven hours too late to set. So I look for a week and fired. And, and uh, they would back me up. But today you would be gone. Right. And Brian Singer would continue with the bullshit he did, goes 40 million over budget and nobody gives a shit. Right. It's not I, money. Yeah. I mean, his last film, I don't think he even finished, but he still got credit for the whole thing. You know what I mean? I think somebody yeah. had to come in and finish it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just uh, 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 horrible, but also a shame for the studio system that they don't see that. That yeah. they stick with people like this, doing over and over the same shit. There are rumors against them, and they only pull the plug if the final write-up in New York Times comes. Brian Singer accused of whatever, indicted by you know, and then it's like, okay, it's over, you're out. Right. So, but before they know it for years, and they give money and money and money, you know, and got like Kevin Spacey. Everybody knew from Kevin Spacey that he couldn't hold his hand still when that boy was running around like whatever a guy in his trailer, whatever, right? So, but it never had had uh, consequences. Yeah. You know. So, uh, and I think that that is ridiculous, and that is where where this kind of going totally overboard started that then somebody gets canceled forever 
who take Casey Affleck. Mm. So I had, I had a project that, that who was interested, whatever, right? And then I asked around and they said, oh, Casey Affleck, you cannot do this. It's like he had that sex scandal. Then you Google it and it was 2010 and it was not even a sex scandal. It was just like he didn't behave good and two cool people flipped completely on set like he's a piece of shit and yeah. they sued him. I got 200,000 bucks. End of the story. So, uh, so that means the Oscar winner from Manchester by the Sea is not getting a job anymore. I mean, right. I don't get it. You know, Manchester by the Sea was 2016. So he was able to get the Oscar where he was still canceled. Mm-hmm. And then right after he was canceled again, like we cannot, nah, you know? So, and and I don't get it. it it's this kind of like where they go way too far. A rapist like Harvey Weinstein is a yeah. different thing as somebody like Bill Murray is hugging somebody and makes a sex joke. Right. Yeah. You know, for this, you cannot say, we don't want Bill Murray anymore in any film. It's ridiculous. It's totally absurd. You know, that Casey Affleck thing, I think they just forgot about it so they could put that Academy Award winning actor, Casey Affleck, on the DVD covers. You know what I mean? And then they went <laughs> to sell the movie and then it just went back to... Yeah, it's, 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 you know, with this culture, it's very weird. You'll have people like Singer that do, like, disgusting, terrible things, but they'll equate them to, like, a Bill Murray that'll just hug somebody and have a joke. You know what I mean? They'll kind of put them all in the same boat when yes. they're not really in the same boat. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, the biggest, the biggest uh, issue that is with uh, society in general is the fact that uh, we can't help but over uh, overcompensate that if, for example, Hollywood lets Weinstein and all those other people do all these horrendous things, and then when finally we as a society stand up and say that we don't accept this, you have to, we ha- those people have to be punished, they're like, okay, yeah, we're totally behind you, it's the right thing, and they do that, but then they throw in anyone and everyone that you know, like you said, Bill Murray hugs someone, makes it a, a, maybe an off-color joke, and all of a sudden he's thrown into the same category. I mean, you can't have. I mean, if if we as a society were actually, you know, acting like intelligent thinking beings, we know that there's a difference between someone saying an obscene joke and hugging someone, and then someone raping someone. I right. mean, those are, you know. Yeah, you can you can talk say Bill, you know, that was not funny. You should not have done that. And, you know, point out that he should be more, you know, careful with his words later on. But you can't just lump him in in the same category as like Weinstein, which, yeah. you know, ha- does so many horrendous stuff for so many years that only recently did they decide to throw him under the bus. Yeah, you know, when he, when they threw him under the bus, that was when he didn't really mean anything anymore. Right. They went full time bankrupt. They, they went in a way down the drain, right? They had only the Tarantino films from time to time, and the rest was crap. So, you know, the, but during the time of the English patient or whatever, nobody would touch him, and he fucked 100 girls mm. without rape. You know, because that we shouldn't forget too that even if he doesn't look like Clark Gable, right. he scored a lot of famous actresses because they wanted to make a career. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, and they are very silent about rape because they didn't get raped. They wanted to have a career. And uh, so, you know, and that is the thing where I always <laughs> said like sex and greed, right? Runs the world. And, uh, it's of course way more complicated as you can summarize it up. I think he felt so invincible that he got more and more edgy. Yeah. You know that he felt like, oh no, whatever. If she wants to leave the room, I don't let her. I block her. I throw her on the bed. What should she do? You know, whatever. I fucked Scarlett Johansson before. Now I fuck you. You know, whatever. So it's this kind of, uh, the thing where um, he it, it went to his head and he felt like he's completely, let's say, invincible. And I had a situation, I, was, I met Harvey Weinstein two times and 
um, I had a, a sales agent, uh, then sales was his name, like sales, what is funny, I think he made it up, I don't know, but he was selling my films, and we were in Cannes, and he came to our sales office, and he had a total swollen blue eye, and i like, what the fuck, what, what, I mean, we're meeting buyers here, Mm. And he went in a bar fight or whatever last night. Yeah. So, and he said, no, he got a Caesar, like a Caesar, like a epileptic Caesar fell out of the bed. Mm. And then years later, another guy told me, Harvey Weinstein hit him. Wow. And, and he was in an elevator and started talking to Weinstein. And it was the time around House of the Dead, basically, this 2003. And Weinstein said, don't talk to me, you fucking piece of shit. And hit him full on in the face. And he, he uh, I mean, he, I think he was stunned, right? And then Weinstein went out. And so that was, that was it, right? So, and, but this kind of behavior shows when a guy is completely thinking nothing can touch him. Yeah. You know, I mean, can be happy that he didn't hit me because I would fucking smash that guy into the pulp in the, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I was not scared of Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. So, and then I met him in, Kazakhstan in Russia, where I was with my Max Schmeling boxing film. And we were at the same, there was like a gala dinner, whatever. And he was at my at the table where I was sitting. And um I had no, he was like, there was a 13 people at the table. So I couldn't yell over to him, whatever. You know, he did, we didn't really talk, but I was the whole time thinking I should bring the thing up with Dan Sales. Yeah. You know, but then I bit my tongue basically, and I felt like nobody would understand that here in fucking Russia, you know. So I felt like, what well, uh, I don't do that. Hillary Swank was there sitting there on the table, and I didn't want it to escalate the situation, but I, I still feel about it. I should totally confront him with it, but I'm sure he would maybe didn't even remember that, right? You know, because he did it all the time, and he would make say, yeah. like a piece of shit. Because people said later, right? He was hitting people in the office. He was doing this all the time to people. Yeah. So, uh, and it's it's uh, perverted, really, really perverted. Do you think some of the the other competitor studios kind of played a hand behind the scenes of getting Weinstein taken down? Because Miramax was such a big deal. It had it housed, you know, Tarantino was there, Rodriguez was there, I think Linklater was there. Um, and when 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 Merrimax went down, it's almost like I think Warner Brothers picked up the Tarantino films, but it's like I bet they had good negotiation powers over Tarantino at that point because they're like, well, we're one of the bigger dogs. You can either go with us or because yeah. Harvey was getting those was producing all of his movies beforehand. I almost feel like they kind of he definitely did bad shit. But I think that when his when he started to dwindle, I think the industry hopped on him to kind of bury him so they could take Tarantino, take Rodriguez, you know what I mean? Take these, you know what I mean? What do you think about that? No, I, of course. I think a lot of competitors were very happy about it, but I don't yeah. think it really planted evidence or something like this. I think it yeah. has escalated up. And, uh, but I mean, Warner Brothers is one of the few studios, look at that, they still do Clint Eastwood films, you know, that guy will be under 10 soon. And then it's unbelievable. So I, I think that Warner, uh, a lot of times I like Warner Brothers in regards of sticking with talent. I like that, yeah. Yeah, you know, and a lot of stu other studios don't have that at all. You know, where you think like, who's the talent at Disney? I mean, you know, like, I mean, it's just like they are exchangeable. There's the product, there's the talent, but the people they do it are not necessarily, uh, it's a little different now with the TV shows like Mandalorian or something, you know, like there are like real guys behind it. They are good. I think mm -hmm. also the TV series from Disney are better as the, as the films actually. <laughs> so, and uh, like Obi-Wan or whatever. And I enjoyed that more as the last, five Star Wars films. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, but Warner, I like it and that they are a little keeping that old fashioned thing. And um, I like it also that Netflix at least did the one, the Irishman, yeah. you know, I, I mean, uh, I think people like Scorsese, how many films he still has in him, right? Two or three, maybe. Right. You know, so, and I think there is, they shouldn't do a mistake what they did with Orson Welles or stuff like this, you know, that legends have to fight for their last films. I think it's an insult to the film history 
saying Scorsese should do whatever the fuck he wants for the last few years of his life and they should finance his films. Sure. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because they one of the few people they do adult films. Uh, you know, for for adults and not for like teenagers, and and uh, I'm I'm happy to see uh, uh, his films, even if the old stuff, of course, was better. But yeah. uh, you know, but the Wolf of Wall Street was the last masterpiece he did. I felt like it was a great film. I loved that. Yeah, film. yeah. and but Oliver Stone is is I loved Oliver Stone. Me too. Right? But I think he it he he in a way. Doesn't have it anymore. Yeah. You know, now, what do you think? What do you think is more beneficial to a studio? Building a director up as a brand or getting like a director that makes a one big film, buying the film, and then have other people people make sequels to it? Because I almost feel like they're kind of want to take the power away from the director as moving forward. What do you think about that? I totally agree. Yeah. And we, it's a very big risk also that they do digital actors. Yeah. Right, with CGI yeah. getting bigger, so they just go to Will Smith, say, "Here, yeah, fifty million bucks. We don't need you, but you will be the lead in our film, and you know you can watch it in the movies, <laughs> see it, right? But we will come to that point. Who knows what now Cameron's avatar will look like? Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what he did the whole time, but yeah. if it's James Cameron, you always have to expect that he goes one step further as anybody else ever did uh, or he would not release avatar right the second part right he would not say if the avatar next part is the same like the first one he will not release it. yeah so and um, uh, it's the same like i mean james cameron <laughs> I, I i love james cameron mm -hmm. right so i mean it's crazy but he's one of the real innovators of film yes. and and uh, um you know, of course, Terminator, Terminator Two were like for me. Terminator Two was maybe his biggest masterpiece for so. for yeah. me. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, Titanic was a film you watch in the movie theater and you think, wow, yeah. but you don't want to watch it again. It's right. like it was for me, like you know, like when it ever played in TV, I said, oh, fuck it, forget, yeah, I yeah. cannot watch it. because it's cheesy, right? So, but 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 in the movie theaters, it was like with Avatar. I went in the first weekend, put the 3D thing on, and was sitting there and was saying, like, I never fucking saw something before in my life, like that quality. That yeah. was unbelievable, you know. But when it comes later in TV, I was the same. Like, nah, nah forget. It. You know, so yeah. <laughs> story-wise, they were not the best movies ever. You yeah. know, so uh yeah, but it's we're coming in a in a and we are already in the face of cinema where lawyers and algorithm deciding what's happening yeah you know and it's not anymore and and, and they are but i think they are wrong that is the problem you know like i just filed something to amazon and so they give you then when you, so you, you send a pitch and then they give you back a tool like a computer tool where you have to fill it in so it has to fit, yeah, like your pitch has to fill in the tool or forget it. So now you fill out every single thing. And I'm sure not humans spitting out if they should do that show. Yeah. Yeah. There is everything in whatever made money, all the box offices or whatever of all the films ever made, you know, all the ratings, uh, all the clicks. And then it spits out consider or like forget it or whatever you know and, and, and i think that is always the beginning of the end you know like where you feel like uh, you cannot even they don't even have anything to say to people if yeah. the computer says that thing is not working per algorithm uh they don't talk with you about the project anymore they just say no forget it so uh you know it's crazy and and uh that makes a lot of times films and programs and shows so so the same you know i have that a lot like this kind of like my kids screaming around so uh, you know like it's it's this kind of like where you have this kind of uh, deja vu you know you think like that show i watched before 
but this time it's a different actors in a different surrounding. But basically, it's the same shit I watched three years ago on HBO. What I see now on Netflix, juggled around a little, you right. know. So uh, that makes Breaking Bad so important, or you better call Soul, or some originals, you know, where you say like that I never watched before. Yeah. You know, where you have that effect. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I, I know you've, you've dragged it. Oh, Alex, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to just interject about the fact that, I mean, we all know that making movies and all that is a business. I mean, everyone wants to put the money in that you want to make a lot of money back. But because now that they've, they've gone with the algorithms and all that, I mean, solely just focusing on how much money that they can make, um, it starts to really negate the artistic aspect of the film. And the fact is, when you start making films just as a commercial product, then, you know, uh, they they don't have any lasting power. I mean, they're, they're good for, like, the day it comes out, but, I mean... You know, a few years later, I mean, you don't go revisit it because it doesn't give you anything because you've seen it once. It's like, you know, you go, you watch it, you enjoy it in the theater, you watch it on TV, but you have no need or want to go and revisit it 20 years from now. And I think it's sad. I mean, I can think of movies that I watched when I was a kid in the 80s and the 90s that I, when I'm bored, I, I throw it out to watch and and I enjoy. But I have a hard time thinking of a lot of things that come out within the last 10, 20 years that I would feel the same way about because they don't give you much of anything to hold on to. It's, it's not even it's not even like it's like Schindler's List where you watch the movie. It's a great movie. But it's not a movie that you really want to go and, and, and watch when you're feeling down or something. It's 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 a thought provoking movie. And but you know, I can still see myself coming back to watch it because when I want to, you know, delve into and, and feel something because it's such an emotional and important film. But unfortunately I don't think that uh films like that are really coming out. I mean, when they do have Oscar films or films that are, they are calling like um, very important now, it's it's all it's all like an algorithm because they they hit the check marks but they don't hit the soul of the story that needs to be told. Yeah, yeah. And it's also like when we thought about Taxi Driver or stuff like this, right? In that times, you had the feeling the filmmakers decided what to shoot. And the distributors were distributing it and hoped for the best. But it was not like the distributor tells the filmmaker that are the 10 different things you have to fulfill before you give us any new script. It was like, you know, like, I mean, when you see, like, as an example, Taxi Driver or you, even Clockwork Orange or whatever, they were not home runs, right? They were not like where you think, like, I mean, when you just plainly pitch a Clockwork Orange, people would say, Oh my fucking god! Are you crazy? Like, where is uh, Reese Spoon in this? I mean, you know, like it, it, its this kind of absurdity where you yeah. couldn't pitch it to make it successful, but it can be successful because it extended our experience. The film made our experience bigger of life. What, like, what sometimes books do too, right? So where you get really drawn into it and you come out totally different as you. As you saw, you come out after reading five, six hundred pages, and films can do the same. Um, that you have the feeling you watched something real and you watched something more as a film. Mm -hmm. And that is always like the best, I think, in, in, in cinema. You know, when Fitzcarraldo from Werner Herzog, when they pulled the fucking ship over the mountain in in in, in the jungle. You know, and Klaus Kinski flipped completely out and wanted to shoot everybody. You feel that on screen. Yeah. You know, you feel that that film got completely out of control as it would be if a guy says, 
we pull a ship over a mountain to come out on the other side of the of the river and then we build an opera house in the middle of the jungle it was the adequate way i think what werner herzog get at that point to transfer this kind of true craziness because it happened in real right the guy actually did that a uh, hundred years before whatever and you know, but that makes Fitzcarraldo for me, for example, a film I will never forget. Right. And there were so many other films I've watched, at least whatever, 20,000 films in my life, where 19,500 were just 100 minutes of my time. But I will, I will they are deleted out of my brain in a way, right? So, and, and that is the thing. It's like, that is what I what I always loved, right? So for tunnel rats, for example, when we built the tunnels, I had all my actors, they were young actors, uh, laying in the tunnels, we switched the light off and we left. I said, so you have to be in absolutely darkness for two hours to just get the feeling, what the fuck these people went through. Yeah. You no, know, they went with a candle in and when the candle was off, you were completely toast. So, and, um, you know, and then we had like a mercenary guy from South Africa. So we went with them in the jungle and we had two groups. They had to attack each other as a, a, a and, and he, because he was in the Angola war, he was in different wars in Africa and he teach them like patience. He said, look, the reality is you watch Plateau and everybody runs and shoots. He said, but if you really get, can get shot, you should be very careful what the fuck you're actually doing and from where to where you run and lay down. So a lot of times he made people lay down in the jungle a long, long time and wait. He said, you know, when it's around you for 45 minutes, completely dead silent, then maybe you can move five meters forward. You know, because the other guys are maybe silent too, you know, but then, and then you have a holding situation where you have to wait it out. And he said, in 10 minutes, you will maybe, if you're really dead silent in 10 minutes, if somebody's 20 meters away, you hear something like a little movement, whatever. So don't go, just stay here, let them run into you. So, and I always tried when I did stuff with like real background, like tunnel rats, to bring the actors in situations that they felt uh, that they learned something. You know, that they, because of course, all that young actors that came from LA to South Africa to shoot, and they were like, they watched Platoon, they watched Apocalypse and Now, you know, like they watched that films, but they had no clue from anything. So I had first a week of that kind of boot camp situation. Um, and I think that helped enormous when they had to act. You know, they were really panicking and scared shitless and stuff like this. And I think you feel that on screen, you know, like that the people were really, really affected by it. And uh, uh, on Darfur, I used real Sudanese refugees living in South Africa playing themselves yeah. and their families got killed they got raped and stuff like this and the american actors were totally like affected by it in a good way you know billy zane was crying they all thought they come for a paycheck to south africa but then they were totally into it all of them were like a mess in a way and uh, um that is i think why Darfur works emotionally very much because you really feel like uh they represent truth there and they don't want to fuck it up and do another B picture. Yeah. So, um, you know, and I hoped when I did that stuff that more people would write about it. And I know that a lot of people see it. You know, if you go on Amazon, look at the ratings of the movies, mm -hmm. you know, that you have a lot of times almost five points, 4.5 points, whatever. So the audience saw it, you know, but I hoped, of course, that also at one point, some industry people see it and say, no, that was like fucking hard hitting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I never saw something like this before. Uh, that is the thing. It's like, um, um, yeah. But the good thing is I can still tell myself it's still coming. <laughs> you know, but you feel like uh, nobody holds uh, uh, somebody back in five years to write about it and say, look, we have to uh, uh, revisit ball. And because uh, I soon have to stop doing it, I have to go upstairs. But, you know, like the um, next year, I will definitely do another bigger film. So 
that was is my my goal basically i'm working on it uh the idea is also to shoot in south africa mm -hmm. and uh i have a film i developed years ago and now we we wrote it down over to south africa basically because in south africa with the full internal rights you get a lot for your money and you have good crews amazing light and you you can do a lot basically you know you less unions and all that stuff yes. and it's basically uh 12 hours is the name and we have like so it's a guy he comes to south africa his mother's dead uh, for the funeral and he lives in in cleveland and for years and years, he's a police officer, and he goes with his uh, daughter and the uh, uh, the wife. And at the funeral, he finds out the mother got shot and didn't die on cancer, how the father said. So he confronts the father and said, like, I mean, what the fuck? Who shot mom, right? And he said, oh, you know, you shouldn't came to the to the funeral. And he said, wait a second, you called, I should come to the funeral and said, but you have, you brought your family and whatever. So then they're coming back to the hotel, family's kidnapped. And his sister, his wife, the uh, daughter kidnapped, and there's only a cell phone. And then he gets a desk, like a list. And he said, the guy said, I would kill your whole family if in the next 12 hours that five people don't die. And then it's a run against the time, basically. He has to, even if they're totally innocent, and uh, he doesn't know why to kill them. And he tried to figure out why I have to kill them. But his father is involved. And like one of the guys he has to kill is his own father. And stuff like this, very hard film. Yeah. But I see if I make that right in that uh, uh, it's something, what is a real film? Where people also at a Netflix or they have to say, look, we have to buy that film because that is really good. It's like uh, uh, different as what we would do, you know. And uh, um, and I'm in the process of getting a, a, a bigger actor doing it. So we're not doing it without a bigger actor. So there, there will be a bigger actor in it. But I'm, I think I can get a bigger actor on this. It's a strong part what people, I think, want to play. You know, it's like totally focused on one guy running through the night and uh, completely losing his shit, you know. Yeah. So... And uh, uh, I would watch it. Yeah. You know, that is the thing. And for me, the biggest criteria is would I watch that film? And I would say I watch that right away. Yeah. <laughs> I know you got to beat feet in a little bit. I had a couple in influential questions on you. Was uh, Come and See, was that a big influence on Tunnel Rats? I felt like they, the bleakness level was right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it was one of the most influential war movies. Uh, Alan Klimov. Uh, masterpiece. Yeah, really. I watched yeah, it. For, absolutely. I, I watched it for the first time in the last two years. It was a movie I was told I should always watch. It was hard to get. Criterion finally re-released it, and I watched that and was just blown away by the bleakness. And I mean, it, it really kind of captures the war deal. You know what I mean? And the roughness of it. Yeah. And, and also, um, with the Rampage movies, which I love because they're all the, the anti-hero type deal. Uh, Man bites dog. You know, did that have a big influence on that? Okay, I, I felt that influence in there. So I just wanted to tip it in there. Yeah. Um, it was the time, you know, the time when I did Run Amok in Germany mm -hmm. was the time of Henry Portrayal for Serial Killer, yes. Man Bites Dog, yeah. right? So they were big, even if they were so almost X-rated films in right. a way, in the 17, right? So, but they were very influential for me, both of the films. Yeah. You know, I think I think you catch a lot of hate because when you did the, a lot of those video game movies, the, the fan base for video games is so rabid. You know, you talk about comic book fans and they get upset if you change something in a comic or whatever. I think that the video game fans are just as fucking vicious. What do you think about that? Totally. Yeah, for even sure. Worse, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, they, they, they're even worse. And, and uh, I was in Seattle at a game convention one time went on stage and there were like 800 people and booed they flipped completely out and yeah. then i told the the convention people i said yeah you know what i mean it's senseless uh, i'm not like yelling against the booing whatever and then i said just that forget it let's go so i i, I said i was nice to meet you all i'm leaving and then i said no no first you have to sign 
the DVDs, like we put, put up a, a, a table where the people could come and I signed their DVDs or whatever. And there were like 250 people. And I said, uh, they all booed me and now I should sign the DVD. So I signed the DVDs, but I started t- talking to them yeah. and said like, uh, so that is it. I have to sign House of the Dead or Blood Rain DVDs, and uh, but I'm the biggest piece of shit on earth. So I mean, how are they all getting together? <laughs> and most of the people know I'm a big fan. I didn't cry. I didn't yell. Right? I said, yeah, but you definitely didn't applaud it yeah. because I said, nobody was applauding at all. Right? So and I said, look, that is the thing. I came. I I feel a little. Uh, absurd now here signing stuff after I got booed off the stage instead of using a Q&A with me asking me some questions right. that was the idea the audience could ask something but you couldn't understand your own work right so it was completely sensitive so, you should have signed yeah. it shit they're like just fuck around <laughs> with them you know what I mean I would be like <laughs> I don't know <laughs> and uh, we always ask everybody one last question <clears throat> we get a lot of filmmakers you know writers authors comedians actors that watch the show we like to ask you know for people going through maybe a tough time or a slump you know is do you have any advice for people that might catch themselves in a rough time within their creative endeavor that might get them through yeah i mean it's not it's it's really uh, um i know this feeling and i know like a spiral case you going downhill as more you think about it and what helped me always was to put my thoughts away from it for a while, you know, and just focus on the daily routines and stuff and say to myself, look, there are like at least 10 million unfilmed scripts. So it's like not normal that a script gets turned into a film, for example. It's very unnormal and very rare. And it has to do also with a lot of luck. You know, and uh, I always like the thing is that in Germany, when, when we have like political discussions here and stuff like this, in Germany, everything is subsidized, get like film subsidies and whatever. And most of it, it's TV product. And in discussions, I always say, look, you basically, like to that subsidy people, whatever, right? It's your fault because you don't try enough people out. Like you give you, there are some directors in Germany that did 25 films, they were full subsidized, right? So, but why not subsidizing this guy's three movies and 22 other people get a shot? Mm. But you, you, you always go for the same things, the same things, right? So, and, and, uh, um, I, that helped me a lot because in Germany, I didn't have a lot of support, uh, to get through it, to say, look, because they have no fucking clue what they're talking about. They don't know film history so good as me or watch so many films or analyze it so much. They're just like amateurs Mm. because, you know, they stopped at Wim Wenders or whatever, you know, like German art house filmmakers and they never appreciate a genre. And that is also a thing what is pissing me totally off because I think genre is what survives. In a hundred years from now, people will still watch Jaws, but nobody gives a shit about Moonlight. Right. You know, because now nobody gives a shit about Moonlight or whatever, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that is the reality, you know? And that that is what I think is, uh, uh, with genre films, um, you can put controversy in, you could political things in like Rampage or Solomon Wall Street, Dafur, they're all kind of genre films but they're transporting truth and reality. And, and a lot of drama is the opposite. A lot of drama is nothing else as trying to smooth things out. They are not okay. Yeah. They are not solved, whatever, right? So, and, and I think that is, we face that more and more uh, on the political landscape. I think that we actually fucking things up and don't repair them, you know, where, where we feel like uh, we're making mistakes and nothing pulls it back or tries to reverse it and whatever, and we, we're running in an open knife, you know? So, no, yeah, but I mean, I think that is a good, good advice, like to put the, the brain for a while away from it. Uh, I had a guy who emailed me years and years ago and um, he did, uh, he wanted to make a film, various films. So, and then he finally <clears throat> did 
started a film and then I never heard from him again. And then a year later, I, I was like chatting with some people and I said, what, what happened to that guy who did that, uh, uh, I think it was Bruno was his name, whatever, I don't remember really the name. And I said, what happened to him? And he said, oh, you don't know that. And I said, what? He said, he jumped in a train. Halfway through the shoot, he did suicide and got like blown into a thousand pieces running in a speed train. Hmm. And that I don't forget, right? And that I felt when I was in discussions, when that subject matter came up, because it was then in the, at least on Facebook and everywhere it was like posted, I said, don't take it serious. Never take it so serious. It's not worse to get unhappy, depressed, or end your life if you make a shitty film or you make no film or whatever. You know, look, don't don't take it so serious. Like, stay, uh, 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 try to see everything with with humor. Don't don't go in that spiral case down. I mean, that guy. Uh, if I could stop him, you know, if he would email me more. But then he got silent. I didn't know what the fuck happened. You know, if you would email me, oh, I have problems with the film. We start shooting two days and it's all fucked up. It has to be something like this. I don't know, you know. But then it was, I think, a very impulsive uh, uh, action, you know, to to just like, you know what? Now I make the film and it will be a total disaster. I don't want to do it. And he jumped in a fucking train, this idiot. You no, know, I'm so mad with that guy. Uh, 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 Twenty four years old. Yeah. You think like insane. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we thank you for being on our show. We, we're going to stay out of the way of the trains over here. You know what I mean? Uh, you're, yeah. you're, you're a good man. You're super talented and you're a fucking badass dude. The fact you got in the ring with those critics, I think every fucking artist in the world has respect for that. I love that. That was great. You know what I mean? Okay. You got two friends over here. You're always welcome back on Thanks to promote so future projects. And yeah. we'll be praising from afar. You have a good day over there, my friend. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. We talk after I make the movie next year. Awesome. Can't wait. Okay. All right. Okay. Talk Bye. soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right, folks. And that was the great Huey Bowl up in this building, man. Um, yeah, man, it was good. Dude. I've been, like I said, I've been a fan since House of the Dead. I remember watching House of the Dead as a teenager and wanting to make films. And the film's got a lot of style. It was scary. You know what I mean? And that was a weird time for films in general. You know what I mean? That early 2000-ish, 2005, mid-2000s. You know what I mean? Um, you know, the Rampage films, I think, are great. You know what I mean? It's, they're real underdog films. And they're super controversial when you think about it. You know, the Blood Rain films were a lot of fun, too. You know, Alone in the Dark, I liked a lot. You know what I mean? Why We didn't really get too deep into it. You know, I'm a big Christian Slater mark. And you know, him being a paranormal dude and having the whole vibe to it uh, of what it does, you know, I really dug, you know what I mean? Alex, what do you got to say about the well, our great guest? I got to say, um, when I first uh, um, reached out uh, reach out to him, I mean, I saw In the Name of the King, Blood Rain, Alone in the Dark, and I enjoyed those movies. And I thought... Uh, I thought they didn't deserve all the hate that they got. I mean, but uh, and then, you know, after, you know, he agreed to be on the show, I decided to go through and start watching his uh, filmography. And uh, I saw 1968 Tunnel Rats. I watched uh, Attack on Door 4. I mean, just those two movies within themselves. Okay, you cannot say this guy is not a good filmmaker. After right. watching those movies, because those movies are by far some of the best film that I've seen in a long time, and yeah. they deal with such you know uh, terrible issues and 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 war and all that. And I mean, I didn't get to, uh, to mention to him, but watching like Attack and Jafar, I I mean, I got really you know. Um, upset and, and moved uh, in the beginning part. And this is just the journalist talking to the people. This mm -hmm. isn't even getting to the horrendous action, okay? This is just people talking to people about the rapes, the, the mutilations, the genocide. Right. I mean, 
The thing is that, uh, I mean, you might have an issue with his subjects or his content or, or, or something else. But you can, in my opinion, you can never say that he's not a good filmmaker. Right. He is. He's really good. And he has a very strong, gritty style, which I think is missing from a lot of movies coming out now, which just focus on, hey, let's make everyone happy and, you know, make as much money as possible. Which those movies are needed, but we also need stuff that do delve into the more uh, gritty and darker aspects of life. Because if you don't have art or film that does that, if you don't have art that makes you talk about situations, then, I mean, it's not doing its job. Right. I like my directors to have a little controversy to them, be a little controversial. And this dude does, I mean... The fact that people got so much hate, I appreciate that. I, I, I find appreciation in that. You know, you take the Rampage uh, trilogy and it's kind of like you boil that down and that's super controversial. You know what I mean? You take uh, Postal, you know what I mean? Super controversial, man. The humor in that. I remember watching that and being blown away by the humor. People have said that my film's humor goes a little too far, might be a little too edgy, if you will, sometimes. And I felt that it was you know right on par with like my type of humor yeah. but uh that was a great interview man and that was a hawkman find and uh that was very cool and uh, we'll have it back on the show when the next movie pops off and uh very good dude you know what i mean i had a good feeling we were going to get down with them because i think i think that uh, there's a lot of us and him and him and us type vibe you know as film fans as people that make films people that didn't exactly have the easiest come up of making films and uh, I think any real, any any filmmaker can relate a little bit to, um, you know, kind of the 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 hard times of coming up if you if you're out of the system. That system thing is huge, like you was saying. You know, it's like if you're in the system, you have the manager, the agent, all watching out for you. You know, we've talked about it on the show before. It's like when those people kind of peel away, when you lose those people, that's when you see <clears throat> cancel culture come get you or something like that because you did something fucked up in the past that they were kind of covering until, and then when they're gone, it's over. You know what I mean? Kind of like uh, when we were talking about uh, Sam Cooke. You know, when Sam Cooke died in that hotel, uh, the record labels, I don't think, killed him, uh, but they did kind of leave him in a situation where he could get killed, whereas opposed if they liked him more, uh, they would have, you know, wanted him to be alive, but they didn't like him anymore because he started his own label and was signing other artists and they didn't like that, you know what I mean? But uh, you be bold, man. Go check out those films if you've never seen them. Go check them out for the first time. If you've seen them before, give them a rewatch. You know what I mean? Because they're good times. And uh, the dude catches hate, and he shouldn't, but he catches no hate from your boys with the Boombastic cast. You know yeah. what I mean? So uh, you want to close this thing out, baby? Yeah. All I have to say is welcome. And I I am so happy that you guys came and enjoyed the latest Boombastic cast. Woo! Peace. Peace. This is a very sad day for Germany and we have great empathy for everybody. Ein 43-jähriger Deutscher hat gestern Abend im hessischen Hanau in zwei Shisha Bars neun Menschen erschossen. Die tödlichen Schüsse in Hanau am gestrigen Abend mit insgesamt elf Toten sorgen bundesweit für Bestürzung. Alle Opfer haben einen Migrationshintergrund. Es war ein Abend, wie man ihn sich schlimmer nicht vorstellen kann. Die Bundesanwaltschaft geht von einer zutiefst rassistischen Gesinnung des Mannes aus. German leaders are calling out the quote poison, that is hatred and racism, after a deadly terror attack in a town east of Frankfurt. At least 10 people were killed when a government went on a shooting rampage in Hanau. Ich weiß nicht, warum die Südländer und der Nahe Osten so sind, wie sie sind. Vielleicht liegt es am Klima. Vielleicht ist es da einfach so warm, dass man nichts machen muss. Die gehören hier nicht hin. Daher sagte ich, dass folgende Völker komplett vernichtet werden müssen. Marokko, Algerien, Tunesien, Libyen, Ägypten, 
Israel, Syrien, Jordanien, Libanon, die komplette saudische Halbinsel, die Türkei, Irak, Iran, Kasachstan, Turkmenistan, Usbekistan, Indien, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesch, Vietnam, Laos, Kambodscha bis hin zu den Philippinen. Der Fehler war, sie alle willkommen zu heißen. Man hätte die Grenzen zumachen müssen. Man hätte bewaffnete Polizisten, vielleicht sogar die Bundeswehr an die Grenze stellen sollen. Abschottung vor den Massen, die da kommen, immer mehr. Ich fahre durch die Stadt und ich sehe nur Kopftücher. All das Schusstraining. Sie dürfen die Akte nicht schließen. Das musst du verhindern. Wir werden Großes schaffen. My personal message to all Americans. Your country is under control of invisible secret societies. They use unknown evil methods like mind control and hold up a modern system of slavery. If you don't believe the following, you better wake up quick. In your country exists so-called deep underground military bases. In some of them, they praise the devil himself. They abuse, torture and kill little children. An unbelievable amount and this already happens for a long time. Wake up. This is one form of reality in your country. Turn off the mainstream media. They don't have a clue. The first step is information. It is your duty as an American citizen to end this nightmare. Fight now. Ich habe nur verstanden, dass die Ärzte es nicht begreifen können. Also habe ich ihnen erzählt, dass sie hören wollen. 